Uh, so hey, uh, I'm Christian. I work as uh, a kernel engineer on the Lexi and LexD team at uh, Canonical, and uh, I'm going to give the subsystem talk. Uh, for namespaces and capabilities, or uh, as Kay said, if containers are the piece that is painting a target on the kernel, we're providing the paint, uh, essentially. Um, exactly, so uh, a short introduction into what, what uh, most people know what namespaces and capabilities are, so I'm not going to do any sort of deep dive, but capabilities are essentially a way to split the root privilege into distinct units of privilege, if you want to put it like this, uh, so that you're not just root can do anything, but you can safely delegate certain types of pri or privilege to unprivileged users by, for example, using capabilities. You have capsys admin, cap mac admin, cap net admin, and so on, and they all regulate certain types of uh, certain types of things you can do. Um, so uh, an announcement I can make is Slipcap now has been released on the 10th of September 2018 search. Uh, Andrew Morgan and I added full ambient capability support and uh, support for namespace file system capabilities. Um, the library also has moved uh, and Andrew Morgan's back maintaining it, so that's pretty cool. He has been AWOL for about a couple of years, I guess. Uh, so namespaces, what are namespaces? Um, I always like to say it's a, basically a very lightweight uh, virtualization method for various aspects of a system. Um, and in contrast to virtual machines that virtualizes, well, basically the whole system at once, it's always just about some specific feature. Um, and what I mean by this is we have now one, two, three, four, I always need to count seven namespaces at the moment. Mount, pit, a UTS, IPC, C group network, and user namespaces. And I guess the easiest way to understand what a namespace is doing is, for example, to look at the oldest one, which is the mount namespace. So ignoring mount propagation for now, if you create a new mount namespace, um, it duplicates your mount table. So all of the mounts you had in the initial mount namespace, you now also have in the uh, ancestor mount namespace. And if you do a mount or umount operation in there, ignoring mount propagation, it will not be reflected in your parent mount namespace. But it's misleading insofar as actually mount namespaces are not hierarchical. There are some hierarchical namespaces, mount is not one of them. But that's sort of the idea. Network namespaces, network interfaces, uh, C group namespaces give you the idea that you are at the root of a new C group tree, even though you're further down in the C group hierarchy. IPC namespaces, POSIX message queues, and so on, uh, are isolated per namespace. PIT namespaces are one of the few namespaces that are properly hierarchical, means each uh, ancestor, uh, descendant, uh, each ancestor space, uh, PIT namespace, can all see all of the processes of its child namespaces. Um, so they're probably nested, you could put it like this. And there are a couple of other namespaces that are in the works right now. Um, so there is a patch set up for time namespaces. This is something I'm going to touch upon uh, in a little bit. Um, device namespaces were supposed to be a thing. They aren't really, but we sort of have a device namespace right now. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. And there is talk about an IMA namespace, although this is likely not a real namespace, but will be tied to a namespace, but Mimi is probably way better equipped to talk about this uh, than I am, actually. Um, so the one final namespace I want to mention is the user namespace. This is the one that usually not a lot of people know too much about. How many people are more f acquainted with user namespaces? Oh, actually quite a few, but not like not the whole crowd. Uh, so for most of the other namespaces, there is no real privilege separation going on. That means if I create a new mount namespace, network namespace, or whatever, I don't get any strong security guarantees whatsoever. I can still shut down the host, I can still show files and so on. The system is still fully under my control. And sort of one of the ideas was, okay, uh, if you want to run untrusted workloads in the age of containers, you better have some way of making sure that root uh, that you somehow isolate yourself sufficiently from the rest of the system so that you, you cannot easily put it in danger. And so why not introduce a namespace that isolates all of the privilege concepts that a uh, Linux system or a standard Unix system comes with? And this is sort of the idea, I guess, for user namespaces or it's, as high, how I like to see them. You introduce a new namespace that just deals with privilege separation. Um, and so there are a couple of requirements in the way that user namespaces work is uh, first of all, obviously what carries privileges on a Unix system, the UIDs and GIDs, so you separate the host UIDs and GIDs from the namespace UIDs and GIDs. Um, 
and, uh, but such in a way that your user and user root ID is privileged over the user NS. So what it means is you can be UID zero from within your namespace, but outside in the parent namespace or the host namespace, host user namespace, it will run as a fully privileged UID, like UID 100,000, and there is a mapping, mapping established between those two. So in, within the namespace, within the user namespace, you have apparently all the privileges this root has, and it's semantically and syntactically somewhat similar to what user as root means uh, on the host, but it's isolated, so it cannot affect any resources uh, that are global, for example, on the system. At least that's the idea. Um, you also want nesting to be possible, so you want it to be a namespace. So you can, as an unprivileged user, you should be able to create a new user namespace. Within a user namespace, you should be able to create another user namespace and so on. So you can have layers of isolation and layers of nesting. Um, and so this is something I mentioned before. The user as root ID should not be privileged over any resources it does not own. So for example, if you have a global limit on the maximum number of files that your system cannot open, user and as root in a user namespace should definitely not be able to set this. Only the initial uh, root user should be able to do this. Um, and the last point I mentioned too, unprivileged users should be able to safely create a user namespace. Um, and the last point is capabilities, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, they should all be charged against the user namespace. Meaning so, if I ask the question, uh, do I have this capability, then what I'm really asking or what I should be asking is do I have this capability in the current user namespace? That model breaks for some capabilities, like for a long time, for example, if you ask the question, can I create device nodes, then the kernel would check, do I have cap make not in the initial user namespace, not um, in uh, the, my current user namespace, although that has changed uh, in recent kernel releases. And you introduce the concept of an owning user namespace that means all of the other namespaces have uh, an owning user namespace such that if you create a new user namespace then unshare your network namespace, that network namespace will be owned by the user namespace that you created. So basically, if you ask questions like, do I have CapNet admin to operate on this network namespace, then the kernel will look, what is the owning user namespace of that network namespace, and do I have the capability in that user namespace? So that's the whole idea. Uh, and obviously, all kinds of other resources, like specific files, syscuttle files, and so on, they can be made per user namespace, or they stay global. Um, yeah, so that's it for capabilities and namespaces. So what has happened? Uh, and actually, I don't know when the last talk was about namespaces and capabilities, so I'm covering 4.10 to 4.18. We can skip stuff if uh, we don't have sufficient time, but actually I think that has happened a lot. Um, so in 4.10, I think it even started before that, there was a lot of work done uh, by Eric and I guess by Seth and a bunch of other people to make, uh, the, to basically get the infrastructure in place to enable mounts from non-initial user namespaces, something which hasn't been possible for an interesting file system before. Like, I mean, you can mount a tempfs or whatever inside a user namespace, but that's not really interesting. A lot of people would be interested to mount, I don't know, X4 inside of a user namespace, which is still not possible, but technically the infrastructure is there. You can do it with Fuse, though. Um, so there was a lot of work done in 4.10 around this. Uh, also, uh, Eric added a new user NS owner to the MM struct so that you can now have sensible ptrace uh, permission checks across exec. This was a security issue that had been around for a long time. I think there was a couple of fixes going in after this as well, but this was actually quite important. Um, Andre Vagan, I, I, I have a good memory for names, so I should hopefully be possible to remember most of the people that did the work, but uh, don't hold me to it. Um, he added an IOCL to get a socket network namespace, uh, so sometimes you need to ask the question, uh, this socket file descriptor I'm having right now, which network namespace does it belong to? This is infrastructure to actually uh, give you an answer to this question. Um, for ELF, uh, for 11, uh, ah, yeah, we finally got limit uh, of I notify instances per user namespace because before you could technically exhaust the global I notify limit uh, from within a user namespace. This hasn't been account or hadn't been accounted for. So this landed in 4.11, uh, security fix. Um, and uh, Michael actually added a new IOCTL namespace, IOCTL Cisco, right? Um, infrastructure to create the hierarchy and properties of uh, namespaces. So, for example, you can ask the question, what is the owning, what is the UID of the creator of the specific user namespace, which is something that is pretty helpful. 
um, because you can answer the question for yourself, do I have privilege over this specific user namespace? Uh, also, you can get the parent uh, of any hierarchical namespace that only affects PIT namespaces and user namespaces. So you give it an FD to a PIT namespace, and then if you have the right permissions, it will give you back your an, an FD to the answers of PIT namespace or user namespace. And uh, also NSGET userness, which is uh, related to what I said before, uh, all namespaces have an owning user namespace. So if you give it an FD to a non-user namespace, it will give you back the owning user namespace. Um, pretty helpful. And further work, and this is an ongoing topic, I tell you that right away, uh, uh, the infrastructure to enable unprivileged mounts, uh, so mounts from user namespaces, there was more work done there. Um, yeah, we will see this popping up. Uh, 412 saw an interesting feature. Um, it exposed the PIDNS for children in PROC PIDNS, which always had been in place for the kernel. So, oh, how can I make this relatable? So, um, think about the question, uh, what PID namespace are children that I'm going to fork off going to end up in? The trivial answer to this question seems to be, well, in the same PID namespace that I am in. Well, not how setNS works. So if you set an S to another PID namespace, you will not, it's by, it's by yourself, change the PID namespace. But if you fork off a new process, then like these ones will become uh, a member of, an, of the new PID namespace that you actually set an S to. And so PID and S for children and, PID and the PID and S value under these proc files will actually be different in that case. And tools like CREUD, so checkpoint restore in user space, needs to, sometimes needs to know this question uh, when, and the answer to the question when restoring a task. Um, yeah, we also, there was also support added for uh, uh, Fuse in PID namespaces. Uh, so there was pro is now proper translation if Fuse is run in a PID namespace. Uh, so Fuse will take care that the PID is actually translated to a valid PID within the PID namespace and so on. It wasn't the case before. Um, and I guess it's not super important, but uh, it was also some work done to enable uh, namespace uh, information in perf output. I've never used it before. Actually, when I looked at it, I, I didn't even know that it just landed, but good to know. Um, 4.13 saw uh, Eric doing some work around, uh, well, bad U-mount performance. Um, it's actually a bug fix, so probably I shouldn't have uh, put it in, but it actually increased U-mount performance dramatically. So if you had overlapping mount propagation trees, the old U-mount code could take up to 60 seconds. I think Andre Wagen uh, discovered this. And Eric refactor refactored the whole U-mount logic such that it tastes down to 0 0.06 seconds. So that's actually pretty good. Um, and the code is pretty interesting too. Um, and Tijin in 4.13 added an LS delegate option to allow C group delegation, safe C group delegation for uh, the root user. It was always kind of safe for uh, unprivileged users, at least if the system administrator set it up this way, but it wasn't safe for various reasons for the root user. Um, and right now, if you mount the C group tree with the NS delegate option, then C group namespaces are considered delegation boundaries. Um, so you cannot escape limits. Uh, it's pretty useful for, I guess, privileged containers, which you shouldn't run. You should always use user namespaces. Um, 4.14, uh, introduce namespace file cap capabilities. Um, actually done by Serge Helen. Uh, good dude, um, and actually was a, uh, that was quite a bit of work, something that we wanted for a long time, unprivileged file system capabilities, or f in general, file system capabilities weren't safe before. So uh, let me come up with an attack. So uh, imagine you, uh, you are allowed to create a user namespace as an unprivileged user. So you create a new user namespace, you uh, set a file system capability, whatever, capsys admin on an arbitrary binary that you just wrote. You, in another term terminal, execute that binary on the host and, well, you're screwed. So uh, it wasn't safe for a long time. Um, it's now since 4.14, um, it is per, uh, per user namespace. So basically the kernel rec records a root UID, which it considers to be the UID that, uh, a namespace or UID root inside of a user namespace needs to be mapped to. Um, and if it detects a mapping for that specific root UID, uh, then it will grant you the rights to execute uh, that file with uh, elevated privileges. Um, yeah. So for example, if you write a, a file system capability with root ID 100,000, 
um, and you try to execute it on the host, the kernel will look at this and we'll see, we'll see. it's not UID zero, so I'm not granting you access uh, to uh, execute that file with elevated privileges. If I uh, go into a new user namespace and establish a mapping such that root ID 100,000 corresponds is mapped to UID zero with inside of the user namespace and I execute that file, the kernel will see, oh yeah, there is a mapping for this, it's fine. Uh, you can execute it with elevated privileges. That's sort of the, the gist of how this works. Um, 4.15, uh, it's actually work done by me in this case. Um, we have bumped the limits of allowed user namespace mappings from 5 to 340. Um, the 340 uh, limit is not arbitrary. It's actually enforced by the kernel and the kernel, uh, the, uh, the structure that is used. So it needs to fit into a cache line. 340 is basically the layout of the structure such that it doesn't exceed the cache line. Uh, if you go any higher, it won't work anymore. Um, uh, so this is useful mainly for the case when you, for example, usually when you run a container uh, that has a user uh, that has ID mapping specified, you sometimes want to be able to write files to your home directory with your UID and GIDs, but all other UIDs and GIDs should be isolated and mapped to, so the host UIDs should be isolated from the container UIDs and GIDs. But you punch a hole into the map that you established by saying, for example, user ID 1000 on the host is mapped to user ID 1000 inside of the new user namespace, but you can only do this for like three or four UIDs and then you're running out of mappings. That's just the limit. Was for a long time. Now you can do it for 340 mappings. It's actually interesting. Uh, the overhead is negligible actually. Um, so for five mappings, you look at 145 nanoseconds stat time, mean stat time uh, for a file. Uh, for 340 mappings, you're up to 164 or something. So uh, the performance impact is also quite okay, I guess. Um, 4.16 saw some new infrastructure implemented uh, to query network namespaces or peer network namespaces. Uh, by passing along a network uh, namespace identifying property. So RTM new link, Dell link, and set link basically allow you to pass along a property for a network namespace, and you can operate on that network namespace without having to set an S into this network namespace, uh, which is uh, pretty p performance relevant, actually. Um, and in 4.17, we finally got to make unprivileged fuse mounts uh, worked with IMA. So this was work that has been done by Eric and also um, in conjunction with Mimi, right? Um, so there were some questions how to, I guess, validate uh, I'm, uh, unprivileged fuse mounts with IMA, right? And it fails by default right now, but you're probably way more uh, better equipped to talk about this than I am. Um, so it was one of the final blockers to actually make unprivileged fuse mounts from usernames or non-initial username spaces work. Um, we also uh, fixed a long-standing bug whereby bind mounts of devpts ptmx to devptmx did not work. So you could have symlinks, you could have a separate device node, but if you tried to do a bind mount, the kernel would just not recognize that it's basically the same mount. Um, so we added logic to make this possible right now. This is relevant for the case where you have an uh, LSM-like app armor that tries to, for example, restrict access to certain files via symlinks, so a bind mount is a way out, uh, out of this. And uh, also, this is the device namespace thing I talked about, U event injection work. So uh, we made it possible that you can inject U events into another network namespace. So for example, let's say you plug in a USB device uh, inside of your computer uh, and you say, okay, this is going to be safe to delegate to a container and then you inject it into a container, which you can do using mount propagation and so on. Uh, but for the container, it actually doesn't appear as a proper device because it never gets a U event. Because U events are restricted, technically not, but get to this in a second, to the initial uh, user namespace. So what we made possible is uh, you get the U event on the host, you can parse the U event, you strip off the sequence number, you inject it uh, into the kernel. The kernel will append a new sequence number and then if you have the right permissions, which is capnet admin, in the user owning user namespace of the network namespace will relay it into the other network namespace, at which point UDFD uh, in running inside of a container, for example, will get notified, oh, there is a new device, a device that just showed up. So it's, as I, we like to call it, it's device namespaces from user space. Um, 
And 4.18 finally saw uh, unprivileged, uh, finalizing the un infrastructure to do unprivileged mounts, um, or as I like to call it, getting away with regressing user space, uh, because this is where we changed. I said before, cap make not was always checked against the initial user namespace. So if you try to do a cap make not, uh, a make not, um, the kernel would look, do you have cap make not in the initial user namespace? You don't, then no, it's not possible. Uh, but right now, it's um, if uh, you mounted a file system that you're on. So if you do did a mount tempfs tempfs slash mount uh, inside of a user namespace, um, the kernel will record what user namespace this has been has been the mounter of this file system, and it has been, for example, an unprivileged user namespace. Tempfs mounts are fine, and then you do a make not. Uh, the kernel will now check. Uh, do you have cap make node within that user namespace? The answer will be yes, you create a device node. But the way unprivileged mounts work is that at the same time, when you mount the file system as an unprivileged user inside of a new user namespace, uh, sorry, inside of a user namespace, uh, it also sets the SBI node F flag on the super block, which means any device nodes that you had prior to mounting this file system or that you create after mounting this file system, you will get an EPERM when you do an open which given how container runtimes work, they always assume if a make node is not possible, then you should do a bind mount, but if the make node succeeds, then it's a usable device node, uh, which is not true anymore. So uh, actually systemd, uh, systemd services and user namespaces uh, and also a couple of container runtimes have been regressed by this, but I talked to Eric about this. He said it's fine, it's probably not a lot of users, so. <laughs> It, okay, it seems okay, nobody complained so far uh, uh, a lot, and it's actually something that needs to be done at some point. Um, anyways, the fun part is just that uh, I talked to Leonard, and Leonard refused uh, to fix it in systemd, because he said it's a kernel regression. So, you can choose, you can choose what the, where the problem lies, I don't know. Um, uh, also, it enabled unprivileged fuse mounts, finally. Uh, this has been work, uh, a lot of work done by Eric, a lot of work also done by, by Seth and a bunch of other people that tried to upstream it because Seth didn't have the time. Um, right now, you can uh, mount a fuse from non-initial user namespaces without any set UID trickery or something. Um, so that's uh, one of the few file systems. I'm not sure that it's gonna be followed by a lot of other file systems because VFS security is different from actual file system security, so meaning the VFS can do all of the permission checks at once unless the file system maintainer, and please yell at me if I'm wrong, gives you a guarantee that we are safe from attacks in the face of uh, a malicious image, uh, file system image, uh, this is probably not going to happen. And I'm pretty sure that most uh, file system maintainers would not feel confident mm -hmm. uh, to enable uh, unprivileged uh, mounts. And we did some more work around user U event namespacing because we figured out that uh, this was broken, uh, like massively broken. So let's say you plugged in a device. Uh, basically what happened is that the U event got yelled into each network namespace on the whole system. Um, but if the network namespace was owned by a different user namespace than the initial user namespace, the UIDs and GIDs that this event came with uh, were not fixed up, meaning UDEF, if you were running UDEF inside of a user namespace, uh, then it will just discard the events, but it was, would be a slew of totally useless events, which is also kind of, it, it's funny insofar as the list of U event sockets for a long time was global uh, before we did this work, meaning if you took a lock, uh, it basically walked the list of all network namespaces in U event sockets, held this lock for as long as a U event was sent into each network namespace. Then for each network namespace, walked the list of multicast sockets that were listening to the network namespace, and then, and so on. So there was actually quite pointless work the kernel did for a long time, so that's gone now. Um, Current patch sets uh, that we see floating around right now, there are a bunch of interesting patch sets, so there is um, the idea to introduce a new time namespace, um, uh, not a new one, to introduce a, a time namespace, which is uh, obviously a big thing for uh, for Creu for various reasons, Andrew Vegan has done a lot of this work together with someone whose name I unfortunately right now don't remember, um, and uh, it's, I think, Maybe it lands. There is some. It's obviously going to be very, I think, a long discussion. Given that uh, time is something that shows up uh, as relevant uh, very early on in the boot process, so changing, changing how time works is a big thing. 
Uh, Thomas Gleixner also commented on a bunch uh, on this patch set, so we'll see where this leads. Um, Alexa worked on a patch set or revived a patch set by, I guess, David Drisdale and uh, Elviro um, to restrict path resolution. So it's similar to, I guess, the unveil idea a little bit, at least, uh, of the BSDs. Um, you have a bunch of ad flags, at beneath, at no proc links, at no sim links, at this root, at xdev, that basically lets you specify uh, how you how you want to resolve a path, which is a, a big security feature, for example, also for container runtimes, but it has uses beyond that. Uh, we'll see where this lands. Um, uh, I think that Alexa right now has changed the idea to why not make it a separate syscall resolve it. I, I don't think that's going to fly, but we'll see. Uh, some version of this patch set will likely land because a lot of people actually want this. Um, the links is where the discussion is taking place always, so you can uh, feel free to comment. Um, and uh, this is going to land in 419, no, in 420 actually. Query peer network namespaces again by sending along a network namespace identifying property. If you put this together, RTM get adder and RTM get link uh, and uh, retrieve network, uh, retrieve information for network devices and their addresses for like, let's say, a thousand network namespaces, it actually cuts the time in half that you would, uh, that you would need if you would uh, do it with set and S attack like retrieve the addresses and then set an aspect to the host namespace. So that's pretty good. And there's obviously uh, David's around here, right? Ah, yeah. Um, David's done uh, an incredible amount of work uh, around the new mount API. That's pretty cool. Um, and hopefully it's going to land soon. There are a couple of uh, discussions still to be had. It's obviously, it's a big change and a lot of people have a lot of opinions on this. Um, but it allows you to really ni do nice things. It basically, one of the ideas is, for example, you split the, the basic concept is get me NFD for a new mount point, configure the mount point, and then apply it, which is really, uh, which is really nice. You also can send around file descriptors for mount points and so on, uh, which also means you can probably make unprivileged mounting safe if you wanted to, and so on. Uh, that's uh, that's really promising, actually. Um, and future patch sets is mostly stuff that I've been thinking about or working on just uh, because I don't know what a lot of people are working on right now. I think Eric is buried in refactoring signal code um, at this point, so there is not a lot of namespace work coming from him at the moment. Uh, one thing that I've been lacking for a long time, and I've been talking to David about this, is recursive read-only bind mounts for the old and new mount API, because you cannot do this right now. So right now, let's say, in user space, uh, you want to bind mount your whole SysFS mount tree into a, at a different location recursively and make it read-only. So you do mount, uh, re -mount, no, mount rbind slash uh, comma ro sys, sys to mount. Uh, that won't do what you think it does it won't make the mount tree read only, actually. Uh, the same as if you do remount rbind ro on a whole mount tree, it also only will uh, remount the top, top most mount read only. Would be nice, especially for um, system managers or uh, init, uh, yeah, init uh, processes like systemd, if you could say, Rbind this whole mount tree read only to a different location, make it atomically in one shot so that we're on the safe side. And also the same for remount. But it's obviously trigger, uh, uh, tricky to kind of figure this out uh, correctly. I have a patch set for this, um, which I have been sitting on because I want to make sure that it works because I fear if I send it out and L doesn't like it, then this was my one shot. Um, so yeah, and the new mount API hopefully we'll see, like we'll apply, I guess, all mount properties recursively uh, right away, but David is better equipped to talk about this. Um, I've been looking into making the U mount uh, syscall reversible together with RumPy. He's probably not here right now, but he's at the KVM forum, uh, by reusing a concept that Eric once introduced, which is basically uh, tuck mounts. So right now, I think if I'm not mistaken, yell at me if I'm wrong. If you do a mount operation, you can, given mount propagation, you can get into a state where the, you do a mount and you do a U mount and you think you get back to the original state of the mount tree before that U mount, uh, before you did the, the additional mount. It's actually not the case. You can do a U mount, but your mount tree looks totally different right now. Uh, with tuck mounts, that's at least Ram's idea, is you can make it such that each U mount gets you back to the prior state of uh, the mount tree. Uh, so we'll see if that actually works out. Uh, still some discussion to be had around this. Um, I have a patch set to make mount propagation in the ZFS syscall uh, 
possible such that you can do a statfs on a mount point and then you can check for ms private ms shared or ms slave in the flags argument because you cannot do it right now you need to pass proc mount info which is kind of annoying um, that's the only way to get this type of information as far as i know right now and this is something i have put uh, on the side and I'm not sure if we're still going to need it, but basically introduce new, uh, two new ioctals to the namespace uh, ioctals that we have right now. One is NS init, which allows you to answer the question, is this the initial, um, is this the initial uh, namespace, which might only make sense for PIT and uh, user namespaces, because I don't think there is a nice way to do this reliably right now, especially when you don't have slash proc mounted. Um, and also uh, um, NS access, which would basically be given this file descriptor to this user namespace and given a file descriptor to this file or this device, do I have privilege over this uh, file or device inside of this namespace? Um, yeah, I, I guess I have run over time. I hope not too much, but um, that's basically it for uh, the namespace and uh, capability subsystem. So happy to take questions. Yes. Michael. Hi, just curious, hi, Michael Kersk. Just curious, what, what is the use case for NS is in it? The NS in it? NS, yeah, NS is, is Yeah, for it. example, it's, it's mostly useful for uh, the user namespace when I want to determine am I in the initial user namespace because then I can uh, um, uh, infer basically what operations I can perform or can't perform. Like if I'm in a non-initial user namespace, I'll be restricted with a lot of, about a lot of things. If I know I'm in the initial user namespace, I know that I can basically do everything I want. Oh, now, now I'm scared. <laughs> uh, David Howells. Uh, uh, two comments. First, on your doing read -on recursive read-only bind mounts. If the open tree system call comes in and we add mount set atra, which will have a recursive flag, you can just do open tree set atra recursive to just change the read only flag and then mount it, which gets you the read only bind mounts. Yeah, so you're saying this will be in the new mount API? Once we've added the mount set atra syscall, which is currently lacking. Yeah. But it's something we need to add, but the, the two bits on either side exist. Yeah. So you just clone that. Currently, with it, you can do bind mounts by doing open tree clone, yeah. which clones that, and then you move the new mounts somewhere else. Yeah. But you'll be able to do a step in the middle, which uh, changes just the read only flag yeah. on all things. Because yeah. currently, with the, the bind thing at the moment, you have to set all the flags on everything because it doesn't have a mask. Yeah. So that you won't actually need an MS rec read only mount flag. Yeah. Because there'll be another way to do it. Oh, you say I won't need that. You won't need that. Yeah, in the new mount API. In the new mount API. Exactly. Yeah, that's the yeah. Uh, hopefully we don't. Like this is this is basically sorry. I should be I should have been clear about this. This is a clutch like I didn't um talk about this. So MS MS rec read only. Why the hell do we go uh, with MS rec read only? Why not MS read only MS rec? Uh, well, not regressing user space. So probably anyone, right, my argument in the initial discussion was anyone in user space who specifies MS rec uh, slash uh, MS read only wants it to apply recursively and wants this to be read only and they're not getting what they want right now. So failing right now uh, would probably make the world a whole, a lot safer place, but it will also break a lot of workloads. So the idea was, okay, we cannot do this. We can maybe print the warning, maybe, but um, going forward, the only way to do this is by introducing a new flag, MS rec read only, which has its own problems, which is why I'm sitting on this for so long. Since we have how many mount flags? We have 31 bits, but all of them have been used. Uh, uh, even though, like, I guess five or some, five flags or so are actually There's mount internal, of, uh, the super block flags. Internal flags, but they're actually listed in the new API. Yeah, the which, which, yeah. They're not in the new mount API, I saw that, which, yeah. yeah. But in the old mount API, you, for example, have MS no user and MS, I don't know, sub mount or something exposed to user space, which, I, for MS no user, this is the flag I'm reusing uh, because you get Einval anyway if you pass it right now. Yeah, but with the new map, when we eventually add Mount Setatra, you'll give it two ma or as two two parameters. One of which is the set of flags you want to set or clear, and the mask to say which of those flags to apply. 
Exactly. And there will be a thing to say, do this recursively. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other comment I wanted to make is you, you had a thing to get me the namespace of that socket. Yeah. We also need to get me the namespace of that file. So, so, so you can ask what the namespace of a particular network file that's on the network file yeah. system is, so you can do some operation in that network namespace. Yeah. That's something we will need to add at some point. Yeah, just some, basically it's a generic IOCTL in, in essence, you guess. So, uh, something yeah. like that. Yeah, sure. Well, it might, not be, it might not be an IOCTL because you have to be able to do it on like a symlink. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, we're running late. Okay, so in this, in this case, let's thank the speaker. It was a really interesting talk.